All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you for another edition of Physics Meets ML. Uh, it is a pleasure to have Tess Smith today uh, telling us about neural networks with Euclidean symmetry for the physical sciences. She is uh, the 2018 Alvarez Fellow in Computing Sciences at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And uh, we're thrilled to have her speak today. She's been working on a number of things uh, in ML, but sort of symmetries is one of uh, her areas of expertise, which is something that is near and dear to the heart of every physicist. So uh, Tess, uh, really excited for your talk and uh, please take it away. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction and thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm Tess and it's a pleasure to be speaking to a bunch of physicists today. Um, my background is in physics. I first did neutrino physics as an undergrad at MIT and then uh, I transitioned to materials physics um, as a graduate student at UC Berkeley and then switched over to deep learning specifically to deal with this issue of how do we get neural networks that respect the symmetries of our data? So I'm excited to talk to you today about this. <clears throat> so I just want to let you know that if you'd like to follow along with the slides, the link is right here. One second. <clears throat> so just tinyurl.com slash e3nn dash physics dash meets dash ml. So if you want to follow along with the slides, you're more than welcome to. And for those of you who haven't been to Berkeley Lab, I just always love to show this photo from the building that I usually sit in. Uh, this is the view um, at sunset. You can see the Golden Gate Bridge. It's really lovely. I hope if you haven't been, once we all can be in the same space, um, hope that you can come visit. So an alternative, oh, let's see, sorry. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so an alternative title to this talk could have easily been all I wanted was a network with 3D rotation equivariance, and what I got were geometric tensors, space groups, point groups, selection rules, normal modes, degeneracy, second order phase transition, and a much better understanding of physics. So I hope that through this, you're going to kind of see that while we were motivated to implement neural networks with Euclidean symmetry for one reason or another, uh, we ended up getting kind of this these multitude of benefits from faithfully treating Euclidean symmetry in neural networks. <clears throat> so the laws of physics have rotational translational and unless you're a particle physicist they have also parity symmetry and we would like machine learning models that also obey this symmetry and so a kind of a common confusion is that well maybe not for this crowd but for other crowds that I speak to um, you know our data sets the actual ex examples may not themselves be highly symmetric but the space that they exist in is symmetric so if a network is our model of physics uh, that model should not be sensitive to things like coordinate systems or choice of coordinate system and the input to the network, which will, you know, lower the symmetry to the appropriate um, subgroup <clears throat> uh, is, is the input to the network, is that that's our system. So if we have this, for example, a bunch of charged particles in a magnetic field and we're describing those forces, our network would sort of be like the function that takes in the charges, the geometry, the velocities, the B fields to produce an output force. So symmetry emerges when different ways of representing something mean the same thing. Um, and I want to distinguish between the symmetry of representations versus the symmetry of objects. Symmetry of representations is probably more familiar to like a particle physicist, and symmetry of objects is more familiar to like a condensed matter physicist. So in the case of the symmetry of, of 3D space, we have Euclidean symmetry. And how this manifests is that it's the freedom to choose our coordinate system. When we write down a system numerically, we have to make a choice of coordinate system, um, but this choice is fundamentally arbitrary. And the way that we transform between these coordinate systems are with elements of Euclidean symmetry, symmetry so translations, rotations, and therefore the composition of rotations and inversions mirrors. Now, if we look at the symmetry of a geometric object, um, an actual object existing in 3D space can look the same under specific rotations, translations, and inversions. So it'll exhibit some subgroup of Euclidean symmetry. So in the case of the benzene molecule, we have the point group D6H. Um, and so this is a highly symmetric molecule. But in this talk, we're going to really focus on this Euclidean symmetry, so this, the 3D space. So what we'll see is that we, we get the symmetry of geometric objects out for free, um, but our motivation for encoding these symmetries is, is because of the general representation of objects in 3D space. <clears throat> 
Now, neural networks are really specifically designed for different data types. And assumptions about the data type are actually built into how the neural network operates. So I've just put kind of a smattering of different architectures here. So if you um, are working with dense neural networks, the fundamental assumption there is that you're going to give it some vector x, you're going to act on it with some matrix w and, and the nonlinearities and so forth. But the primary assumption is that the components of that vector transform independently. And so you don't need to take any special consideration of two numbers um, basically traveling together in any specific way. For 2D images, um, we have convolutional neural networks. And the assumption there is that the same feature can be found anywhere in the image. And this notion also fundamentally encodes locality, that pixels that are next to each other are more important than those that are further apart. For texts, you might use a recurrent neural network. I guess nowadays you'll use a transformer. Um, but if you have sequential data, uh, basically the next input or output depends on what has come before. And then for graphs, you have topological data. You have nodes and, and messages being passed between uh, those nodes with edges. And then today I'll talk specifically about 3D data um, and using Euclidean neural networks for that. But the key thing is that um, these operations fundamentally, like they encode the symmetry for this neural network. So while dense neural networks don't have really any symmetry, we have 2D translation symmetry with convolutions, forward tr time translation for recurrent neural networks, permutation symmetry for graph uh, neural networks, and then last but not least, uh, 3D Euclidean symmetry. So I just kind of want to have that idea that symmetries in neural networks is, is a well-trodden path um, purely by how we architect uh, our neural networks. Okay, so let's say we're interested specifically in 3D data. Um, how do we make models symmetry aware, for example, to understand the symmetry of atomic structures, which are typically represented with coordinates labeled by atom type? Uh, these coordinates are sensitive to translations, rotations, and inversion. How do we make a a model that sort of understands this. And in the literature, there's three primary approaches. Approach one is just throw data at the problem and see what you get. So this is the kind of data augmentation traditional machine learning approach. Approach two is to take this inherently um, equivariant, which I'll define later, or covariant a representation for these molecules and convert it to some sort of invariant input and then give that invariant input that will not be sensitive to choice of coordinate system uh, and then put that into the neural network because it can't possibly mess it up. Approach three is to actually have um, all these transformation properties handled by the network operations, either with an invariant model or an equivariant model. And again, I will, def I will define invariant versus equivariant in a moment. So th these are my relative feelings on each of these. Data augmentation makes me sad. Um, there are specific use cases where it's, it's very um, important and useful, um, but not for handling Euclidean symmetry, in, in my opinion. Um, invariant inputs can be super expressive, especially for kernel methods, if your um, featureization is really well chosen. Uh, but my personal favorite are to build the symmetry directly into the model. Um, and today I'll specifically talk about equivariant networks. Okay, so let me define, oh, actually, let me check in. I didn't say at the beginning, if you have any questions, please, please, please um, ask that, feel free to ask them during the talk. Um, so I think someone will hopefully monitor the chat or, or I'll glance over to the chat and um, I will try and answer your question to the best of my ability. Um, but yes, if, if I'm saying anything unclear, I would like to correct that as soon as possible. So I'll just wait one second to see if there's any questions, have a cup of tea. All right, okay. All right, so let me define invariance versus equivariance. So if you're used to the term covariance, that lines up perfectly with equivariance. And invariance and equivariance is thrown around a lot, especially when talking about symmetry imbued neural networks. So if something doesn't change under some group element, some operation, then we say it is invariant. But if it changes deterministically, so it changes, but we know exactly how it's going to change, then we say it's equivariant. And I'm showing you know, whether it's invariant or equivariant with these closed or open boxes. And let me just run through an example with a 3D vector. So a 3D vector has three properties. 
It's got a magnitude, it has a direction, and it has a location. And each of these properties transform differently under the uh, elements of Euclidean symmetry. So the magnitude and direction are invariant to translation, but the location is sensitive to translation. Uh, only the magnitude is invariant to rotation. Uh, and only the magnitude is insensitive to inversion. Uh, so the magnitude is an invariant quantity, whereas the direction and location are equivariant quantities. Let's see. Okay, I see one question. So during the talk, can you also comment on the efforts on topological approaches to neural networks that may not be Euclidean? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, so maybe if you don't mind, if you can ask that at the end and maybe we can clarify and I can try to answer your question. Thanks for the question. All right, so one thing I do wanna say is, is one of the reasons why, so data augmentation is used a lot for images, 2D images. You can usually get away with about tenfold augmentation if you wanna identify rotated cats. But for 3D, this gets much worse. So for 3D data, it's very expensive. You need about 500 fold augmentation and you still don't get the guarantee of equivariance. You still don't guarantee that it's gonna be able to identify your object in any orientation. So if I have like a bunch of these, I have a box and I want it to identify that this is a box, um, I'm gonna to need to show it 500 different rotations of this box, even if you know I have a 3D network. So it's looking at it from all angles. Um, I still would need just a huge augmentation to, to see this. So training with symmetry is just a lot more straightforward. Okay, so we talked about quantities being invariant or equivariant, but what about functions? So for a function to be equivariant means that we can act on our inputs with some element G or on our outputs with some element G and we're gonna get the same answer. And this is for every single operation in the network. So it's not just kind of at the whole network level, it's actually at the individual operation. And for the function, if it's, if it's invariant with the input, um, that means G is just the identity. So it just, it doesn't, it doesn't change no matter what operation we perform on it. And you might ask, uh, well, maybe less so in this audience, but many audiences are like, why should we limit ourselves to equivariant functions? And one important reason is that it substantially shrinks the space of functions you need to optimize over. So if we consider the gargantuan space of all learnable functions, and we have all learnable equivariant functions, it's much smaller. It's much, much smaller. And this means that your data becomes much more powerful because if I look at all learnable functions constrained by my data, that space is likely much bigger than the space of all equivariant or of all learnable equivariant functions. And if you want to learn something about physics, the functions that you actually want to learn are at this intersection of functions that are constrained by your data and functions that are equivariant. And so it really reduces that search space. But why not go a step further? Why not limit yourself instead to invariant functions, functions that only act on scalar quantities? Uh, the trick with this is that this can be extremely effective, but you have to guarantee that your input features already contain any necessary equivariant operations already. So for example, let's go back to the example of charged particles in a magnetic field. At some point, you need to compute a cross product between your velocities and your magnetic field. And if you don't have that, I really can't think of a way that, that you're going to be able to get the right answer. So again, if we look at the space of all learnable equivariant functions, all learnable invariant functions is a much smaller subset. And then you can either run into the situation like that you know all the invariant functions constrained by your data will be in the space of invariant functions but the function that you actually wanted to learn either it is an invariant function or can be well approximated with an invariant function or it lies completely outside the space of invariant functions and your model is just not going to perform well so this is sort of the situation that we want to make sure we can avoid um, and why having equivariant methods is very helpful so any questions on that? All right. So I want to give just a high level picture as to how Euclidean neural networks achieve um, equivariance. And this is the work of many people that I'm summarizing here. Um, so not just myself. So I highly recommend 
that if you're interested in this topic, these are all great papers to read and I'll put them at the end of my talk so you don't feel like you have to scribble anything down right now. And some other relevant folks whose work is excellent that I highly recommend looking at are, are here. Okay, so Euclidean neural networks are very similar to convolutional neural networks, except for two important differences. So probably the, the most notable difference is that we have an equivariant convolutional filter that's based on learned radial functions and spherical harmonics. So we take our standard convolutional filter, in this case we're doing continuous convolutions, which is why W, which is normally like your little voxel filter, um, in this case it's replaced by a continuous function W. And if we have a convolution center, our vector is going to be the vector to any neighboring atom. And so we have constrained our equivariant filter to be separable into a scalar radial component, really important. Turns out that the only way you can have uh, learnable features in a Euclidean symmetry equivariant network is that the learnable parameters must be scalars. And then we have the spherical harmonic. And the reason why we have the spherical harmonics, um, there's kind of many ways to explain why. Um, one of the reasons is that spherical harmonics of the same L, so of the same order, or the degree, I always get it swapped, but of the same L, uh, will transform together under any rotation. So if I have some rotation G, um, I have my linear combination of, let's say, the L equals 1 spherical harmonics. Um, this element of G, I turn into a Wigner D matrix, which will be 2L plus 1 by 2L plus 1. Uh, and then I can rotate my spherical harmonics to my new coordinate system. And what I get are still L equals 1 spherical harmonics, but they just have different coefficients. So another way of saying this is that spherical harmonics transform in the same manner as the irreducible representations of 3D rotation, so SO3. Okay, I see that I have a question from Gabriel. Let's see, you mentioned earlier, I think that invariant functions were the identity. Are there invariant functions in this context that are not the identity? Ah, invariant functions um, are not the identity. It's that if I act on them with an element G, uh, the action of that uh, element is the identity. So it just means, so equivariant functions, your group action commutes with the function, and it does as well for invariant functions. It's just that it trivially com uh, commutes because it's just one. <clears throat> Hopefully that answers Gabriel's question. Thank you for the question. Great. Okay, so yes, we have our equivariant convolutional filter, and then not only because of this, but another thing that is different about this network is that we no longer have scalars in our network. We actually have geometric tensors. And so everything, every scalar operation in our network needs to be replaced with its generalized tensor equivalent. Um, so this allows us to have much more complex interactions. And just to give a concrete example of what types of interactions do I mean, um, let's say we have two vectors in the network and we wish to interact them. Uh, how do we do this? Well, we could interact two vectors to get a scalar, we could interact two vectors to get another vector, or we can do an outer product and get a 3 by 3 matrix. Um, so we encode this with sort of a generalized geometric tensor product. And for those of you who <clears throat> To quantum mechanics with Griffiths, this is where your Klebsch-Gordon coefficients come in, or your Wigner 3J symbols, if you prefer. Uh, and so these are these have to be built into the network. Actually, I'll pause there. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'll keep going. So the input to our network is geometry, and then features on that geometry, specifically geometric tensors on that geometry. So here's a toy system. I have two uh, point masses that each have masses, velocity these accelerations. So I would basically give the network, I'd say, okay, here's where my points are, and here are the masses, velocities, and accelerations for my two points. In addition to that, <clears throat> we have to categorize our features by how they transform under rotation and parity. So the key thing is that we have to identify um, how our features correspond, how they are decomposed into irreducible representations of O3. Now you'll note that I said SO3 for our filters and O3 for our inputs, and this is because geometry has a distinct parity. So our network generally can handle irreducible representations of O3, so not just vectors, but also pseudovectors, uh, things like this. Um, so this is the key difference between a standard neural network is, is that you really have to specify what are you giving the network. 
Um, so the way that we identify this sort of from a from a, just a programming sense with our framework that I'll show later is that we have these representation lists that we just always denote as RS. And so not only do I give it the geometry, the features, I also say, okay, I have one L equals zero or scalar feature with even parity. And then I have another feature. I have one L equals one, which corresponds to a vector. You have to permute the indices, but it's a vector, uh, which has odd parity. And then I have another, I have another feature that means something different but it still transforms in the same way. So acceleration and velocity are not the same thing, but they have the same transformation properties. I can also um, compress this, rep this list to, to look like this. So that's just hopefully to give a little bit more of a concrete feeling of how we give things to the network. Okay, so what does equivariance give you? You know, you go through all this math and what does it get you? Well, it gives you a lot of things. So give it a molecule and a rotated copy. Coffee. Let's say you want Sorry, did someone say something? I'll assume not, okay. Um, so given a molecule and a rotated copy, the forces, let's say you wanna predict forces with these networks. You predict the forces for the molecule and the rotated copy and you're guaranteed to get the same forces modulo that rotation. And another consequence of this is that these networks generalize really well to molecules with similar motifs. They're extremely data efficient. Let's say you're working on atomic systems. So obviously I'm a little biased here because I, I spent my PhD working, working on atomic systems. So a lot of my examples are atomic systems, but they, they also apply to just any, any physical system in 3D. So for crystal structures, there's no unique way to show a crystal pattern. Um, you can use sort of the smallest primitive cell, even that's not unique, a conventional unit cell, which is usually bigger, or even supercells. And no matter how you represent your data, as long as it means the same thing, the network will treat it in the same manner. So this is super useful. You don't need to sweat about, is my crystal in the same form, in the right format? Um, you can just give whatever crystal structure is convenient for you. Okay, let's see. Um, I've got a question from Jesse saying, does your code allow for spinners? Half integer, great question. Um, it currently does not, but it's actually not too difficult to put it in with the poly matrices. Um, it's something that we would like to do, but we have not had a specific uh, example or we haven't worked with anyone who's really needed them. Um, even in a lot of condensed matter cases, um, we're, we're always talking about observables. And so we can usually get away with, with representing things with vectors. Um, but yes, like, uh, you know, half of the irreducible representations of SU2 are are the same as SO3, so um, there's definitely a way to do it. All right. Another thing that we can do is that we can express tensors, let's say of atomic orbitals, because they transform in the same way as the irreducible representations of SO3. Um, so we can express these kind of complex tensors of atomic orbitals and predict things like molecular Hamiltonians, um, sort of in any orientation from seeing a single, single example. So on the left, I'm showing you a water molecule and it's just rotating. And then I'm showing you the corresponding Hamiltonian. And as you can see, it's kind of easy to intuit what the water molecule is doing. And it's really hard to kind of intuit how the matrix for the Hamiltonian is gonna change. So the nice thing is our networks understand that given one of these matrices, it, it knows all the others. Okay, let me see, I've got another question. Let's see. Um, Jacan says, does this network extend to Minkowski metrics or is it only Euclidean? Um, you can use similar techniques to extend to a Minkowski metric, but this specific implementation does, does not know about time. So, but these types of techniques can be extended. Thanks for the question. I have another question now. Sure. Um, um, so, you, you had this nice input uh, vector where you say, okay, you start with these representations essentially. How about later on in the network when you might uh, encounter much higher representations? Yeah, um, so you're just asking like, are there higher representations in the network or? Um, well, they might appear, right? I mean, somehow. Yes, yes, and in fact, sometimes so. you, that's what you want to make, um, which is actually relevant to this slide. Um, yeah, so you might give as input, so you have your geometry, and geometry always has, carries a representation of L equals 1, but using our 
convolutional filter, what we can do is we can kind of promote that geometric information into a higher L, um, basically by using spherical harmonic projections. Um, and so between, you know, between that and just multiple interactions, you can, you can get up to as, as big an L as you would like. So in practice, we typically truncate it up to some L because the, the more L's you have, because the L, like the, the number of spherical harmonic or the number of um, uh, components of the irreducible representation grows 2L plus 1. So you, you get quite a, quite a large network if you go up to like, I don't know, L equals 20 or something. Um, and so far, for, for the applications we've been looking at currently, we, we really only need to go up to like L equals 10 for, for geometry generation. Um, could, could I ask a question? Um, sure. Yeah, so could you learn if there was a higher symmetry? So I'm thinking, for example, the hydrogen atom yeah. actually has an SO4 symmetry. Right, right. Even though you start with O3 or something. Yeah. Could, could you learn that, that some higher symmetry emerges with similar techniques, maybe? So I think it's possible, um, but that much more depends on the how you structure the learning task. So I don't, yeah. you know, what I'm proposing here, or like what I'm showing here, does, wouldn't necessarily indicate to you how to go about doing it. But I think it is possible with sort of a clever articulation of these networks. What's nice is that then you, you can isolate how is the symmetry different than the symmetry I'm already assuming? So I think there would be a benefit there. I mean, I, I'm just wondering whether it's like you've got a hyperparameter, which is the number, which is the dimension of the rotation of symmetry, oh. and you fix it at three. And then, you know, sometimes it might be two that is there, sometimes it's three, sometimes it might be accidentally four. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, it's a meta problem. Yeah, so unfortunately we don't, we don't have a hyperparameter for, for saying, okay, now we're gonna do irreducible representations of S, O, N. Um, I wish we did. Uh, that might be something we could do in the future, but at the current moment, we have the, um, just the irreducible representations of S, O, three tabulated. Or I should say O, three, or sorry, S, O, three. Parity we deal with separately, um, but I think that'd be really interesting. I have to think about it more. Yeah, Let's see any other questions. Oh, I see another question in the chat. As is currently known, one can embed symmetries into the architecture of neural networks. What about the inverse problem given a data set with undiscovered symmetries? I think that that touches upon David's question. What are the ML approaches to detecting them? Um, I know that there is a bunch of work in this space for detecting symmetries, and um, I'm not uh, I'm not totally up to date on those methods. Um, but I'd be happy to investigate a bit after this talk. So thanks for the question. All right, thank you all for the questions. All right, so another thing that Euclidean neural networks can do, and this is something that equivariant networks can do and invariant networks have a, a lot of trouble with is that they can be used to actually manipulate geometry. Because you're keeping the geometry in the network in full fidelity, you can actually sort of go between geometry and features, features to geometry very nicely. And this is really promising for geometry generation tasks, which is something I'm really interested in given that my background is in materials design. Uh, and the way we do this is, is effectively through spherical harmonic projection. So the way that you go back from a spherical harmonic projection to geometry is, for example, you could choose to just take the peaks of this signal. And so you don't need to go to very high L. You don't really need to get these little delta functions in order to tell where to put a point if your points are well distributed. Okay. Um, so that was just kind of saying, what are some of the things that equivariant networks can do? Uh, here's some quick uh, demonstration. So Euclidean neural networks are extremely data efficient. We've been using them on atomistic tasks and so far um, the results are really promising. And so working with Boris Kaczynski at Harvard and his graduate student Simon, uh, we've been working to use uh, Euclidean neural networks for ab initio molecular dynamics. And so here is just one data set that we trained on, which is for um, water either in liquid or in, in solid phase and compared to the original network that was uh, produced with this data set or i'm sorry um, we have this water data set it's roughly on the order of a hundred thousand snapshots and that's how much the model was trained on originally 
uh, for deep MD. But with our network, we can achieve better accuracy with only 133 points. And so that's a, that's a substantial data reduction. And that kind of means that we might be able to use higher levels of theory where we can't calculate that many data points, but we could calculate, we might be able to calculate 100. Um, so that's really promising. And then we've also used these networks to predict phonon density of states for crystal structures in order to determine materials with high specific heat. And this is work with Ming Deli and his graduate students, Santa Chen and Nina Andreevich. Um, and so this is just to show you uh, some of the phonon density of states that it's predicting. And one of the big bonuses of using an E3N here is that it's able to capture the space group symmetry because that's just a subgroup symmetry of Euclidean symmetry. So that's a really nice aspect of these. Let me see if I have, oh, okay. People in the chat are figuring things out. All right, so that's just to show that we have run these on some practical applications and they're promising. I also want to discuss some of features that are consequences of fully treating Euclidean symmetry that we didn't necessarily intend, but it makes a lot of sense that these features are there. So one, that I, one thing that I alluded to already is that all data, input data, output data, intermediate data, all of the data in Euclidean neural networks are geometric tensors. And they're sort of the data types of 3D space, and they have many forms. Um, so ones that you're probably familiar with are the vector. And again, these are basically defined by their transformation properties under 3D, uh, all the, the symmetries of 3D space. But we can also think of things like pseudo vectors, which don't invert. Uh, if, I, if I invert my coordinate system, it does not invert. Um, you can think of them as sort of rotation axes. Uh, we can have things like double-headed rays, which transform as L equals two. Or we can have a spiral, which also transforms as L equals two, but has odd parity. And so all these fun geometric objects can be faithfully represented using these networks. All right, another thing is that, you know, the spherical harmonics or atomic orbitals, hydrogenic atomic orbitals also transform as irreducible representations. And so that's another thing that we can very easily predict is that if you want to predict electron density, that's exceedingly natural to do with these networks in the atomic basis. Another consequence that, again, makes a lot of sense, but surprised us as to what it implies for how you construct training tasks, is for these networks, the outputs have to have equal or higher symmetry than the inputs. And this is a well-known principle, um, often called Curie's principle from Pierre Curie in 1894. He articulated in French, so I don't know if this is a translation. Um, when effects show certain asymmetry, this asymmetry must be found in the causes that gave rise to them. And so what this means is, let's say I initialize three random models and I give it an input that's a tetrahedron. And let's say each tetrahedron just has an identical scalar sitting at each, uh, at each point. Then my model, if I ask it to output a linear combination of spherical harmonics up to let's say L equals five or six, uh, I can get these lovely shapes. But the important thing is that they also have tetrahedral symmetry. So this is what happens if I actually, I'm taking the features, the output features on each of these points and I am averaging them. And that's how I'm getting a single signal versus four separate signals, just for simplicity. But you can see that these distinctly have tetrahedral symmetry versus if I put an octahedron, they distinctly have octahedral symmetry. And this has a lot of important consequences. Uh, well, first of all, implement group equivariance, get all subgroups for free, which is really important for people studying molecules and crystals. Um, it also means you can use these models as symmetry compilers. So this sort of touches upon, you know, if you did make a model that has SO4 symmetry, um, you know, you would be able to tell whether or not like uh, uh, the hydrogen uh, atom has that symmetry if you use these types of, these types of methods, because they basically act as symmetry compilers. They cannot fit a model that doesn't symmetrically make sense. They cannot make a model that violates Euclidean symmetry. And to show this, I will give you two, two tasks. So one is to deform a rectangle to a square. So basically, if I give you the inputs, the vertices for this rectangle, predict displacement vectors to make it a square. And then we're going to do the opposite task. Given a square, distort it to a rectangle. And what we find is that uh, 
it can do one and it can't do the other. Now, let me explain what's happening in this figure because rather than just showing vectors, I'm actually showing these blobs for the displacements. And what I'm doing is I'm having it predict the spherical harmonic projection of the desired displacement vector. The reason why I'm doing that is because of this guy here. Because um, this, so when we're going from the rectangle to the square, network has no problem overfitting going, yeah, I can do this, no problem. Um, I can you know, make a blob that perfectly overlaps, has a peak at this orange point. So that, there we're good. Here, what do we have here? We have two blobs. It's as if it's confused. It's as if, well, I kind of want to put something here and I kind of want to put something there. And what's happening is that the network predicts a degenerate outcome. It is giving you a linear combination of two equally valid solutions, either the rectangle that is going along the x direction and the rectangle only going along the y direction. And the important thing is I only showed it one of these rectangles, but because it's rotation equivariant, it must be the case that it views these solutions as equivalent. So this is really interesting. So turns out that trying to turn a square into a rectangle is not a symmetrically well-posed task because it inherently um, invokes degeneracy. And let me just quickly look over the chat at some of the questions. Roughly how many parameters does an equivariant network use relative to a standard network for the same problem? I don't have an exact number for you, but it's substantially less. And even for an invariant network. So we can see that we can achieve the same results as an invariant network with I don't know, half or less the number of parameters. Um, I have to give you exact numbers, but at least half for comparing to an invariant network. And then Avira has a question, is the width of the spherical harmonic projection associated with some uncertainty in the output? Ah, that's really great. So in this particular case, the width this, of these blobs has more to do with just to what L I decided to cut things off. So it's less about the uncertainty and more about at what point did I cut off my spherical harmonic basis for expressing the answer. So that's more of a choice. And it's a good choice as long as you don't have lots of points that are close to each other. L you can think of as, as angular frequency. And so as long as you don't, you don't have to sample two points that are really close, um, then you can get away with very low L. We've got one more question um, from Zoran. So in the symmetry breaking case, is the model capable to predict the spontaneous symmetry breaking for some point group symmetry for molecules? Um, so it's interesting. So the network itself, the way I've trained it when it, I've done this task for you right here, uh, no, it cannot break symmetry. But, but we can break symmetry using gradients to the input. So, um, okay, so just, yeah, just emphasizing that the network doesn't know the symmetry of the inputs to the outputs, it's just acting it covariantly. But to get to the question that was just asked, we can find how the input needs to differ. So basically, what are the symmetry breaking order parameters necessary to bring the input and output to be symmetrically compatible? And so in this case, what we were able to do is that we say, OK, we start uh, with an overfitted model where it's detect it's it's predicting two degenerate outcomes. And we say, OK, well, let's say you could change the input. You could change the input to have additional irreducible representations that represent some symmetry breaking um, in your system. What, what, would that, what would the representation of that symmetry breaking be? And so what we find is that you know, we basically gain additional features of our initial uh, scalars. So we only gave it like a, an identical scalar on each blob we're actually able to gain higher order features that break symmetry and basically breaking the x direction and y direction, differentiating them, saying the x direction is different than the y direction. In this case, I'm only showing the uh, even parity, the same parity as the spherical harmonic ones. You can also get even parity um, L equals three and L equals five uh, features, but I'm not picturing them because they're a little less intuitive to geometrically interpret. Um, but we actually can find symmetry breaking order parameters and we can also use this to do symmetry analysis. So it's really interesting that by building these principles into the network, it enables you to go about some pretty classical problems um, or some pretty um, prevalent problems in physics in a different approach without needing character tables, without needing space groups or point groups. And you can even use this, for example, to find 
order parameters for very complex phase transitions. So this is a perovskite, a parent perovskite structure. And one thing that perovskites love to do is they love to have their octahedra tilt in very complicated patterns. So here's just some examples. And so what we did is we were able to, we showed the network this structure, we showed the network this structure, and we were able to recover the order parameters that are traditionally associated with this complex phase transition, which are a bunch of pseudo vectors um, that have a particular pattern. And not only that, um, by constraining what our order parameter could be, we were able to find a symmetrically intermediate structure. So you can play a bunch of games. Now that your symmetry questions can be articulated as optimization problems, you can do a bunch of interesting things. Okay, so sorry, another question um, from Jory. Why are there only two degenerate solutions instead of all rotations of the rectangle? Great question. The reason for this is because the square is in a particular plane, and that's the only reason. So you can definitely come up with problems where you will get like a degenerate solution that's like a rotation. Like if you have a rotomer on a molecule, you have some, some part of the molecule that is free to rotate. And let's say you're going from like a coarse grain representation to a fine grain representation, you'll definitely get like things that are actually um, revolved around a specific axis. Thanks for the question. All right, so how are we doing on time? Oh, perfect. Okay, last but not least, um, if you'd like to try this out, we have spent a lot of time building a framework to hopefully make it really easy to test out what Euclidean neural networks can do for you. So we call it E3NN, and this is the GitHub. And basically what this library contains are not only modules for building Euclidean neural networks, but also for manipulating geometric tensors between common basis functions. Um, which is very useful if you're dealing with practical data uh, for visualizing spherical harmonics, which makes it really nice for either debugging the networks or even just understanding a little bit better what features are important. And so the developers of E3NN are myself and Mario Geiger, Ben Miller, and Konstantin Lubchevsky. And together we are working really hard to make sure that this framework is usable um, and has documentation and tutorials, things like that. And so you should feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions. Uh, I just want to give you a taste for what this framework looks like. So let's say you want to create a basic convolutional Euclidean neural network. Uh, what you have to do is you, again, you have to define your inputs and outputs in terms of these irreducible representations, where the first number is how many copies of that irreducible representation you need. Uh, the second is the L, and the last is either one or minus one for what is the parity of, of that object. And then you just have to define some model parameters so again, your inputs, your outputs, um, kind of how many channels do you want in the middle? What's the maximum L you want in the, in the network? Uh, layers, radius, because it's a convolutional neural network, and the number of basis functions for your radial basis. And you just stick that into one of our kind of pre-built networks and you can, and this is actually the network that we use for most things. Um, to convert between Cartesian tensors and EREP tensors, you can calculate degrees of freedom, such as like the elasticity tensor. So I'm just going to make a dummy uh, rank four tensor here. But let's say uh, I put the rank four tensor in and I'm saying, OK, this is a Cartesian tensor, but it has these certain symmetries on the indices. So IJKL equals uh, JIKL and so forth. And I want to say, OK, well, give me the irreducible representation for this rank four tensor and it can do that and give you the transformation matrix. So it'll give these representations and it gets the correct number of degrees of freedom, which is 21. Um, I think this problem is solved in like an appendix of Mildred Dresselhaus's symmetry book. So I, I, I felt really good when, when we actually had code that could solve this in two lines. And you can, you can do this for other tensors too. It's really helpful. Um, you know, you can do things like, let's say I have a symmetric matrix. I'm plotting it here with just various colors. Um, I have a symmetric matrix. If you would like, you can visualize that as a, what we call a spherical tensor, which is a linear combination of spherical harmonics. Uh, and it's just a different way to visualize your data, which this is, this is useful for certain types of MRI data um, where you have directional information. Um, so it's just another way to look at your data all within the same framework. I want to give a big shout out to our collaborators, which make building this repository so much fun and so much more interesting because they often come to us with, oh, I need to do this with the network. We're like, ha, huh, well, that's really interesting. We need to implement this general thing so that you can do that and so other people can do that. Um, so I want to just give a, a big shout out to them. 
I'm going to put up this quick recap. Um, basically, we've talked about neural networks with Euclidean symmetry. And the way we achieve this equivariance is through specific convolutional filters and geometric tensor algebra. And you can get a lot of unintended features by encoding your assumptions faithfully into a model. Here's a bunch of resources if you're interested in learning more. One stop shop is to go to a3nn.org. We have a very nice landing page for kind of getting oriented to all the available resources. And my email is down here. Please don't hesitate to, oops, how do I get that to disappear? Um, no. Okay, well, my, my email's there. Hopefully that will disappear. Um, and I'll take any questions you guys have. First, I'll take them from the, the chat. All right. Oh, we got a lot of questions in the chat. Okay, so one question from Eugene is, is this extensible to permutation equivariance? Yes. Um, I guess I would say, so the convolution operation, so the network itself is permutation equivariant. So if I give my like atoms in a specific order, the outputs are still in that order. And if I switch them, the answers switch. Um, convolution operations are permutation invariant because you basically take a neighborhood and you sum it. So the summing operation is, is an invariant operation. So in that sense, uh, it, you know, the convolution operation is invariant, but the network is equivariant. Um, I think there, you know, if you're talking about like being able to do anti-symmetry and stuff like that, um, then I think you need to be a little bit more careful about how you're doing some of your convolutions, but essentially, yes. And then we've got a question from Vincent. Can E3NNs only be used with float 64 or also float 32 or even mixed precision? Um, Great question. Uh, currently, we have it such that it's fixed at flow 64. This is not an inherent limitation. It's more of, um, it depends how much you want to ensure equivariance. And for us, uh, uh, we fixed it at flow 64. There are ways to coerce the models into doing float 32. If that is important to you, please let me know and we will make it happen. Glint says, um, some of the difficult problems in physics, gravity and relativity are best represented with geometries that are not Euclidean, require Ramanian and Minkowski. There are efforts to generalize, um, were efforts to generalize geometric deep learning efforts. Uh, could you comment on state of the art of these efforts? Uh, okay, geometric deep learning going in beyond 3D data. Let me see, is this with Federico? Sorry. I just don't remember this paper off the top of my head. Uh, okay, I haven't read this paper in a while. So I'm not going to be able to totally answer your question. Um, there is a lot of work in Max Welling's group uh, to do things with like gauge symmetry. Risi Condor recently put about a, out a paper with Lorenz symmetry. Um, so I think there are efforts out there. Yeah, obviously this network in its current form won't be able to handle those use cases. But these types of methods can be extended to other symmetries or dealing with gauges, dealing with changing metrics um, and things like that. So yeah, definitely possible and would definitely require a, a change of infrastructure. Let's see, Barack is saying, uh, wondering if there are any links to Clifford algebra, which would maybe unify the notions of play. I'm sure there are. Um, I unfortunately don't know enough about Clifford algebra to know. I would, you know, I will, uh, well, I would say like I'd, I'd buy you a coffee, but I know we're, we're separated. Um, if anyone wants to sit down and chat about Clifford algebra with me, I would love that um, because I would, I would love to understand this better because I, I do think that there may be some really elegant ways to formalize this stuff, even, even in the code. Um, so that would be great. I'm sure there are, but I don't, I don't understand it well enough to know. Okay, if your network has only one layer, then is your method equivalent to using equivariant kernels? Ah, interesting. Okay, so equivariant kernels um, can be very complex equivariant functions. Um, so I would say that you could construct an equivariant kernel with an equivariant network, but it's not necessarily a single layer because your kernel function is up to you. It can be as arbitrary complex as, as you want. Um, and so you can, you can definitely emulate 
or learn equivariant kernels and then use it for a kernel method. So you can learn an equivariant function, use it for a kernel method. Um, so they're very related. Let's see. Okay, so Bahador is asking, from my experience, it's seeing the framework is really memory inefficient. Could you please is explain why, or maybe I not used it properly. It is currently memory inefficient. That is correct. Um, the reason for this is because we currently, so when you do a tensor product, you start getting a combinatorial number of outputs. Um, so, you know, you interact two vectors, so one and one, and you get zero, one, two, and then you interact them again, and you get even higher orders. Um, so not only do you keep getting higher orders, but you also just, everything's interacting with, with each other. So if I have like three vectors and three vectors, you know, it's three choose two different ways that those are going to interact. Uh, and so this is why it's currently memory inefficient. It is because we are using the most general tensor product, which is not completely necessary. And this is actually something that we have active pull requests or active um, changes to the code being done right now to basically enable, um, easier ability to articulate which subset of tensor product interactions would you like to include in the network. So it is a, a current feature of the code, but is that's not going to be a feature for very long because we're working very hard to make it easy to articulate more customized tensor products. Thanks for the question. I think that's everything in the chat, uh, but I also want to encourage people if you'd like to actually just um, unmute yourself, you're also welcome to do so, as long as that's okay with Jim. Let's give Tess a big round of applause for us. <laughs> um, that was a beautiful talk, but since we're out of the chat, maybe people can can you know turn on their videos and ask you questions. Yeah, thank you all for your questions. These are fantastic. I'm sorry I can't answer all of them, but they're all great. Hi, Tess, very nice talk. May I ask you a question? Sure. Um, so let me uh, formulate my question. If you... If you take the kernel representation of ANNs and you enforce equivalence to translations, you recover or you discover CNNs. Yes. If I take ANNs and I take the kernel representation and I enforce equivalence to the symmetries that you are enforcing, do I rediscover your networks? Ah, uh, um, you're saying specifically for kernel methods or? Well, you you can come up with a kernel representation. You know, you can you can see the previous layers of a of a network as as parameterizing a, a kernel, and then you know that you can create equivalent kernels by averaging a non-equivalent kernel with respect to the action of a, of, a, of the group, right? Um, I think you might you might recover some aspects of it. Um, I don't know if you would recover, like for example, like our our equivariant nonlinearity. Some of those are sort of strange. So for example, like one nonlinearity we have is that we go back and forth between spherical harmonic projections and real space representations and apply the nonlinearity there and go back. Um, I'm sure you, you might be able to approximate it. Um, but as it, if it does it just fall out of it? I think if you were just looking at the convolution, I think you might you might recover it. Um, I'm so not sure. In your setting, you are constructing equivariance by hand, right? You are using yeah. a representation that you know to be equivalent. Yeah. But if you were to use this averaging principle, you could enforce equivalence with respect to the action of any group. That's probably right. I think I'd need to think about it more. I'm, I'm not sufficiently familiar with this technique to just say off the cuff. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, I was wondering about translation invariance. It seems like you yeah. know about translation invariance. Do you also, does this also capture that? Yeah, so convolutional neural networks are, you can either call them translation equivariant or translation invariant. Yeah. Um, I think of them as translation invariant because they don't handle, like, for example, if we have a translation operator, hmm. like we do in condensed matter, you pick up a phase, and this is not handled by, by a convolutional neural network. You need an additional uh, symmetry for that. Um, so I think of them as translation invariant. So the way that we have our translation invariant is because we only use relative coordinates. So if I'm at a convolution center, I'm at some atom and I'm looking at the atoms next to me, the way I achieve invariance is that I'm only calculating the relative distance. So I have, I have no sense of what is my arbitrary origin. 
Mm, okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, hi. Um, so there's a, if you're using this code, you have to select some number of features. Do I get that right? That's right. Yeah. So, um, so the effectiveness of your code will presumably be sensitive to that mm -hmm. and how, you know, how, uh, how bad does it get? in terms of computational expense as you increase the number of features? Yeah, so currently, uh, due to the issue that we talked about earlier about using general tensor products instead of doing like group-wise tensor products or other subsets of the operations, um, yeah, the scaling is not fantastic right now. But um, again, that's something we can fix. Um, yeah, you basically choose the number of features by whatever you need to do the problem. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So, well, I'm, I'm thinking of a, you know, of a, a many body context in which I have no idea how many features I need and it um, might well be infinite in some sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, um, so, uh, I mean, I guess there, the, you know, trial and error is the, the, um, the main way, uh, to get at that. Yeah, um, I would start small and go up from there because right. I think something that should be emphasized more in the machine learning community is that a model that isn't capable of fitting your data is telling you something. Um, not necessarily, you know, it, it may be telling you something. Maybe I should say a little bit less strongly because, uh, for example, in the case of the square to rectangle case, uh, that's because it was symmetrically ill-posed that it couldn't get the right answer. Um, sometimes you cannot emulate certain types of data with certain types of of expressivity and you need to go to some higher representation. Now, it also could mean that your network is poorly initialized and gradient descent is just not going to be able to do anything. Uh, so, so there's some things to, to untangle, but I do think that starting small and seeing if it's improving with increasing parameters does tell you something. Okay, great. And one more question in terms of, you know, improving, you know, the, the, um, expense. So if I have some many body system with a discrete symmetry group doing an E3 equivariant um, neural network would be dramatically overkill. Um, and I'm, okay, sorry, go ahead. So so you said that you if you know if you have a molecule with a certain discrete symmetry group, you get that for free um, by using your approach. But suppose you know a you know manageable discrete symmetry group. How do you think you would go about you know building that in to make it sort of easier to do this um, this job? Yeah. So for any any subgroup of of the Euclidean group, you can represent those irreducible representations in terms of the irreducible representations of the Euclidean group. Um, yeah, so you, you could manually put them in. Uh, you could say, okay, we will only need this subset. I don't think that's actually gonna really cut your computational costs because you still will need to represent things that um, you know, may have up to a certain rotation order. I think the biggest thing is that if you, if you know you have only up to some rotational symmetry, uh, you just know that you don't need to go up to very high L, which we don't in practice do anyway. So I don't, I don't think you're gonna gain much by tailoring the ear ups because yeah um because the, the key the key troublemaker is is that tensor product which is solvable so you can do Thanks. it I, I don't think i don't think that's going to be where the computational savings comes from i think it's going to come from the tensor product optimizing the tensor product another thing too is that the the tensor the geometric tensor product is not like something you can call in pytorch or tensorflow it is not an optimized Thing, and it involves a bunch of very small matrices. And so um, one thing that Constantine has especially worked on is writing a CUDA kernel to do a tensor product, which is a, kind of a Herculean task. I've seen his CUDA code. I'm like, oh my gosh, the indices are frightening. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's what I think is probably the biggest component of the optimization. Thanks. Any other questions for Tess? 
maybe I'll ask one while we wait a minute for it to come in. So um, beautiful talk. It's really cool to see these symmetries emerge in natural ways in neural nets. Uh, something a lot of people in, in my group are interested in are cases where there's some hyperparameter n such that in some infinite n limit, the neural nets are drawn from a Gaussian process. Mm -hmm. um, and then for conv nets uh, and many other architectures, there are known limits. Is there a hyperparameter here um, that, that lets you get a Gaussian process in a limit? Do you know? Oh, gosh, I'm not sure. I mean, my friend Yasmin would be a better person to ask about this. Um, I guess you guys already had her talk. Um, yeah. She's actually a co-organizer now also. Um, oh, OK, great. Yeah. yeah, she's one of my favorite people in the world. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, I, I guess you could, you could make them infinitely wide, but I'm not. Well, so, so in the normal conv case, it's just the number of channels and the, in, in yeah. the channel limit you get the GP. Is there some natural analog here to, for that? I mean, you still have channels, like a standard convolutional neural network. The only difference is just you've replaced all your scalar operations with tensor operations. Right. So that's the only, and I, I don't think that that would necessarily impact at what point it becomes a kernel um, or a Gaussian process. Um, but I, to be honest, I don't think I am familiar enough with how you do these analysis to right. say. I, I, can, I can look into it. Um, I'd be really interested to know the answer. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think it might be related to something that's coming coming up in, in, in the chat also. But yeah, I mean, uh, it would be very cool if there were sort of a function space distribution approach to this that was close to Gaussian, where the, the Euclidean symmetry and input space was baked in in this way. Um, that would be nice. That would be very cool. Yeah. Let's see, there's more questions in the chat. Um, Barack is asking, sometimes a symmetric input yields a symmetric probability distribution over elements that are not symmetric. For example, future states of a skateboard from a single frame, you'd have a distribution symmetric over two directions of motion, but the elements would involve motion in one direction or the other. Is there any way of getting that kind of symmetry breaking randomness in this sort of architecture? Yes, and I'm currently working on it. <laughs> um, yes, so, so if we go back to the square to rectangle case, um, the output that it's giving you is a linear combination of solutions, but it's not really sampleable, which is frustrating. And so one thing that I've been working on um, recently, um, hopefully hoping to get back to it after some deadlines, um, is basically making a sampleable output. So rather than just having a, a vector uh, of outputs, like can you actually have a matrix where you can sample eigenvectors of you're learning a matrix instead and you can sample those eigenvectors and you can weigh them by their eigenvalues and things like this and this would be really uh crucial if you want to do geometry generation because geometry is, is generation is also a thing where you will have statistical output when you construct a molecule there's a certain likelihood that the next subgroup is going to be um you know one thing or another and so i, I think that's a great question um and I, I hope to have an answer for you in the not too distant future, but feel free to to follow up with me if you'd like to talk more about it. And yeah, so to anyone anyone who uh, would like to chat more, yeah, please don't hesitate to email me and uh, we can set up a video chat. Let's see. Um, Jakai is asking, is it possible to rewatch? Will it be on my GitHub or blog? I think Jim will. I don't know how videos are posted. Uh, so, so they're on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, and uh, hopefully by the oh, end. Oh yeah, sorry, the... Fabian answered that already. Um, okay. Yeah, gosh, so many great questions. That's really exciting. Yeah, I think you win the award for a number of questions. Oh asked man, I am asked. honored. I'm very excited. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> Eugene, um, or Eugene, sorry, I'm very sorry if I've mispronounced any of your names. I'm trying my best, but I'm also terrible at pronouncing just about anything. Uh, can you write graph neural networks with E3NN? Fantastic question. Uh, you can actually think of E3NNs as graph neural networks with specialized message passing functions and um, tensor products and these sorts of things. We actually do now use PyTorch Geometric to handle especially atomistic data and handle uh, periodic boundary conditions. So if you're familiar with Torch Geometric, using our framework is very easy because uh, you use the same data types for the inputs. 
just you, you additionally need to deal with all these irreducible representation stuff, but. Anyone else have a last pressing question? I think that's it. All right. Well, uh, I think that's it. So everyone who is still here, uh, which is still quite a number of people, thank you for being here. Let's thank Tess for one last time and um, you know, clap wherever you are. Uh, and we will see you in two weeks. Tess, it was a wonderful talk. Thank you Thank so you. much. This was super uh, I will fun. Have the video up on the YouTube. Yeah, it was, it was great. Um, I'll have the YouTube uh, uh, video up hopefully by the end of the day. And I assume it's okay for me to go ahead and just snag your slides from the public link and then- Yeah, absolutely. Let me know if you run into any issues, like if you want a PDF or something and it's not letting you do that, just let me know. Perfect. All right, well, everyone is, uh, Thanking you in the chat as well. So thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. And uh, I will go ahead and stop the recording.